Thank you, Phil, for the wonderful song leading. And thank you to everyone <coughs> for being here and for engaging in this worship service with us on this Lord's Day. I'd like to call your attention as we begin our lesson to Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. This is a context in which the Apostle Paul was meeting with the elders of the church at Ephesus that he had established probably less than a year earlier. He was in Miletus meeting with these men, recalling their years of service <coughs> together as they were preaching and teaching God's Word in the midst of persecution as well as success in terms of converting people to Jesus Christ. He's reflecting upon their shared experiences. But he was not just reminiscing. He was meeting with them and giving them a message of inspiration, a message of encouragement, a message that they were to remain faithful and strong in that faith. And he also teaches them that there's going to be those who will depart from the faith even from the ranks of the elders. And they need to be aware of that and be on guard against any false teachers that would come into the church of Ephesus and make sure that false teaching was defeated. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, he says as he's speaking to them that he was testifying to Jews and also to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith toward Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the title of my lesson this morning. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says that he was able to testify of repentance toward God and testify of faith toward Jesus Christ because he was an eyewitness of Christ. The Apostle Paul was able to testify solemnly to bear witness because as an Apostle, he was a witness to the truth of the Gospel. As Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 22 point out, that was a requirement of all the Apostles that they bear witness of the truth throughout the world. And he became one of those Apostles. He had seen the resurrected Christ, which was also a requirement for an Apostle. He saw Jesus Christ in his resurrected body on the road to Damascus as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8 he had seen the resurrected Christ Jesus had appeared to him and then he had received the gospel of Christ through the Holy Spirit of the Lord as he testifies in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 through 13 and again in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37 the Apostle Paul testifies that his preaching were really the commandments of the Lord Jesus. He says, the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. So the Apostle Paul was certainly able to testify of the Messiahship of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, and the truthfulness of the gospel message having been given to him by the Holy Spirit. And we have that message yet today in the written word of God. We can read it ourselves. We can understand it. And we can also apply it to our lives as we are all expected to do. Facing eternity, we do not want to leave this earth without the gospel in our hearts and in our lives. So the Apostle Paul talks about all that he had done in a... <clears throat> capacity of an apostle as he's speaking to these elders in this town of Miletus. He's speaking of, as I mentioned, repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. In fact, all that Paul taught and all of which is in the gospel and makes up the gospel is included in these two broad categories. Repentance from past sins on the part of man and faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son and our Savior. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. That's the essence of the gospel message. And that's what we are required to acknowledge yet today. When we turn to the scriptures of Almighty God and read them and seek to apply them to our lives. 
No principles in the Word of God are more important than repentance toward God and faith toward Christ Jesus our Lord. All that man does in response to God's offer of salvation is either directly or indirectly an expression of repentance or of faith. Romans chapter 15 and verse 23 talks about the importance of faith, where it says, for whatever is not of faith is sin. All that we do in life has to be done with realization that it is pleasing to God, or at least not condemned by God. If we do anything that God condemns, then we are guilty. Then we've done something which is not of faith. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The only way to know those things which are of faith is to read them in the Scriptures, to hear someone preach them, or teach them from the Scriptures. So we have the Word of God with us to teach us how to live. And if we do, or say, or live in such a way that was not based upon, and thus saith the Lord, well, we can say, I know that God approves of this. Or I know that God does not disapprove of this. Then we are committing sin. All that we do must be of faith. That's a very powerful message there, a very strong message. Furthermore, Colossians 3 and verse 17 says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have to be very particular about knowing the Word of God and applying it to our life, living by the Word of God. That's how we live by faith. And there's nothing more important than mankind, either in the ancient world or in the modern world, than to live by faith and die in that faith. And if we do, we are assured of a home in heaven, that crown of glory when this life is over. So faith is very important. It's at the very essence of the gospel. But also repentance toward God is also very important. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 3, or listen to me as I explain what's going on there, here Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders. These were hypocritical individuals. They were leading people astray, as Jesus points out on several occasions. And here in Matthew chapter 3, Beginning in verse 7, it is said of John the Baptist, as he was uh, speaking on this occasion, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bring fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing hand is in his his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. How are we to avoid? What does John say to these people to avoid that unquenchable fire? It goes back to their need to repent. Verse 8, therefore bring fruits worthy of repentance. Therefore, faith and repentance. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ our Lord are the predominant themes of the Bible. It should be the predominant themes of how we live as individuals. Whether we're Christians or not, all people have this responsibility. Not just those who are members of a particular church, but God's message is for everyone. And if we don't obey God's message by obeying Jesus Christ and putting Christ on in our lives, we have nothing but this unquenchable fire to look forward to when this life is over. <clears throat> Take a look also there at Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. He does something rather subtle that we may not notice unless it's called to our attention. 
He talks about his testifying to Jews and also to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Does not faith come before repentance? Why does he mention repentance first and then faith? That leaves us a little bit puzzled and confused because we reason, well, what motivation would I have to repent unless I already had faith in Jesus? But yet he's putting repentance toward God before faith in Jesus. I think that's important. I think it's significant. You know, we talk about the five steps to salvation. We talk about hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you've got the word of God, you've got hearing, and that produces faith. And then we are instructed that we are to repent and be baptized. That's the order that uh, the apostle Peter mentions in Acts 2, and verse 38, when the people ask him, what must we do? He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And then we know that there is confession of Jesus involved in that process somewhere as well. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 32, If anyone confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And he who does not confess me before men, him I will not confess before my Father who is in heaven. <laughs> And according to the King James Version of the Bible, we have an example of that very confession by the Ethiopian. In chapter verse 37 of that chapter 8, where Philip was teaching him, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's confessing Jesus to mankind. So these are what we refer to as the five steps to salvation. Hear the word of God, repent of our sins, confess Christ as our Savior, and uh, to uh, be baptized in Christ after we've heard the word of God. But here, repentance is mentioned first. I think the reason for that is this. That before a person is going to be motivated to believe in Jesus Christ as God's son, he needs to believe in God as the creator and as the father. That's why repentance is mentioned first. I think maybe that's the point that Paul was trying to put out. One must have a proper attitude toward God, and having a proper attitude toward God, the Father will make one more disposed to expressing faith in God's Son when they learn about Jesus as God's Son. It's impossible to repent toward God before believing or having faith in Him. Let me repeat that. It's impossible to repent toward God without having faith that God exists. Same thing refers to Christ. We cannot repent toward Christ without first having faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the one through whom our sins are forgiven. But it is quite possible to repent toward God before believing in Jesus or before having faith in Jesus. It is possible to repent toward God before we believe to have express faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that's the point that Paul is making here. Here Paul is apparently referring to the necess necessary attitude toward God that needs to be in place when one comes to Christ. We have to understand who God is and respect God and be willing to obey God. We need to know God before we're willing to be opened up to learning who Jesus is. Well, I think that's Paul's point here. Repentance toward God is maybe even more basic than faith in Jesus Christ. Because one has to have an attitude of humility and obedience toward God Almighty. Knowing that God is all powerful, that we are simply His created beings. We have to understand something about God before we're going to accept Jesus. People who don't accept God will not accept Jesus. Have you ever heard of an atheist who became a Christian? Has there ever been an atheist who uh, professed faith in Jesus Christ? No, that's never going to happen. So the idea there, I think, as expressed by Paul, is that we have to have an understanding and a knowledge and a fear and respect for God before we are going to accept Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we have many examples of people who are referred to as God-fearers. People who feared God, they were not Christians. 
Sometimes they were Jews, other times they were Gentiles. But they were God's fears in the sense that the foundation for accepting Christ had already been laid in their life because they already respected God. They knew that God existed. They had faith in God. They knew God was all powerful. They believed in Him. And having done so, they were willing to accept the truth about the Son of God who was sent to this earth to forgive mankind of his sins. So has Christ ever preached to people who did not believe in God? Think about that for a moment. In recognizing the importance of believing in God, was Christ ever preached to people in the New Testament who did not believe in Christ? Or who did not believe in God? Think of the sermons of Peter in Acts chapter 2. Peter was speaking to a group of Jews who obviously believed in God. They were followers of God from eons past. And there in Acts chapter 2, the entire theme of this lesson is based upon the deity of Jesus. He didn't have to prove who God was. They already knew that. They believed in God. So he started with the fact that Jesus was the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. Then turn to Acts chapter 3, which Peter was teaching the lame man. In Acts chapter 3, and verse 6, he says to the lame man, silver and gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then to the crowd of Jews who were there on that same occasion, he's talking about Jesus. Philip to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, and verse 5. Acts chapter 8 of the 5th verse, he says, And the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the, uh, the miracles which he did. And he goes on to point out, in verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Another group of Jews to whom Philip preached Christ. Christ, not God, appeared to Saul, on the road to Damascus, in Acts chapter 9. In verse 5 of Acts chapter 9, the context says, And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goals, or to kick against the reality that you're persecuting Christians, you're persecuting me, you're persecuting my church, I'm not going to put up with it, and you're going to change. So Paul was converted by, to, to Christ as a result of Christ appearing to him on the road to Damascus and being baptized into the body of Christ. But God did not appear to Saul on the road to Damascus, did he? Christ did. Saul was a Jew. He already believed in Jesus Christ. Then to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter was preaching to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 36. It says, A word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Christ Jesus, he is Lord of all. Who is Cornelius? He was not a Jew, but he was a God-fearer. He feared God with all his household. So all these people to whom Peter was preaching and Philip, they were preaching to people about Jesus Christ. Compare that to Paul's sermon. For example, in Lystra, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 15, beginning, where Paul was preaching to these pagans, they were not believers, they were not Jews. He says there in Acts chapter 14, beginning of verse 15, Men, why are you doing these things? Because they were worshiping Paul and Barnabas, thought they were gods. We are also men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He's preaching not about Christ here. Here, Paul is preaching to these pagans, these Gentiles, about God. Because they had to understand who God was and appreciate God's blessings before they were going to accept Christ. Christ is not even mentioned in the last short record of his sermon here to these pagans in Acts chapter 14, in verse 14 beginning. He starts with God. And the same thing is certainly be said with Paul's sermon to the philosophers on Mars Hill there in the city of Athens 
in Acts chapter 17, beginning, if you would, in verse 23, he says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And then he goes on from there, he's talking about God. He's talking about this deity that they didn't worship, that they were ignorant of. He's introducing them to God Almighty, teaching them that they need to repent toward God. That needs to come first. It's not until verse 31 where Jesus is mentioned, where he says, Truly, times of ignorance, God has overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this by all, to all, by raising him from the dead. There's a reference to Jesus at the very end of the lesson that Paul was teaching to these people. So why did Paul say that he was testifying in the city of Ephesus in Acts 20 verse 21, a repentance toward God and a faith in Jesus Christ our Lord? Because repentance toward God is a foundation, a prerequisite for preaching Jesus and accepting Jesus. Again, nobody ever accepted Jesus, confessed the name of Jesus, who did not believe in God. Nobody was ever baptized into Christ who was an atheist. He did not believe in God to begin with. That's why repentance maybe comes first. Maybe that's what Paul was thinking here in Acts chapter 20 as he's speaking to these elders from the city of Ephesus. But let's talk for a moment about the importance of repentance. There are two words that encapsulate the plan of salvation. That encapsulate God's part and man's part in salvation. The one word that encapsulates and describes man's attitude toward God is repentance. If you can think of one word that would sort of wrap up into one ball of wax, the entire attitude, the entire response that mankind needs to have toward God, it would be repentance. Because repentance is acknowledging that you're sinful. Repentance evidences a certain knowledge of God, or evidence, if you please, that God exists. As Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 23 points out, that God has left evidence for his existence, and that's what those Romans need to understand and base their obedience to Jesus upon their acknowledgement of God. Then humility and obedience. Those are all attitudes that people have to have toward God that are encapsulated in the concept of repentance. If a person is brought to repentance, that he has a knowledge of God, there's evidence to convince him that God exists, that God is in rule, that God is going to judge us on the last day. He believes that, he has a certain amount of humility, and he's motivated to obey God. That's what repentance is all about. There's really nothing that we do as Christians in coming to God that is not directly or indirectly an expression of repentance. What is the one word, on the other hand, that describes God's overall attitude toward man? It would be that of forgiveness. If you can think of one word that describes God's overall attitude toward mankind, love would be there. I guess love would have to be the first one. But, we, but forgiveness would be a close second. Because God's willing to forgive us when we repent. They go together. And it's necessary for us to obey and re repent of our sins in order to be obedient to God. If you would turn quickly to Romans chapter 2 and the fourth verse, Romans chapter 2 and the fourth verse, the Apostle Paul writes, For do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Repentance is motivated by one's respect for God, knowing that God is good, that God is long-suffering, that God is forbearing. Knowing that motivates us to be repent, uh, to repent uh, toward God. And over in Second Timothy, chapter three and verse nine, 
Second Peter, rather, verse 3, or chapter 3 and verse 9. Second Peter 3, verse 9. Begin verse 8 there. Second Peter chapter 3. Beginning just right there in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this quality of God, of forbearance, and long suffering, and kindness, leads us to repent. Because we know that if we repent in sight of Almighty God, we want to receive the blessing of forgiveness. And all these things are ours if we'll simply come to Jesus Christ, knowing that He was sent by God to forgive us of our sins, to die on that cross. And if we're obedient to Jesus Christ, we repent of our sins, those sins will be forgiven and we can stand justified before God. Again, in Acts chapter 5, in the 31st verse, it says of Jesus, Him God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. So there you have that combination of repentance and forgiveness of sins. They go together like a horse and carriage. They go together like soup and sandwich. They go together like love and marriage. Repentance and forgiveness. Man repents. That's the essence of his attitude toward God. God forgives because it's the nature of God in his love to forgive mankind of his sins. We have that blessing through Almighty God. So without repentance, there's no forgiveness. It's really the bottom line. The bottom line is we have to repent in order to be forgiven. That's the importance of repentance. Let's conclude our lesson with a brief discussion of why it is so hard for people to repent. Why is it so difficult? Why is repentance such a difficult command to obey? I think the command to repent is one of the most difficult that we are expected to respond to. It's not just difficult for non-Christians. It's difficult for those of us who are Christians. We all sin, even as members of the body of Christ. We have to repent from time to time, but it's not always easy. It's never easy to admit that you're wrong, and that's what repentance is all about. It's not just admitting that you're wrong, but it's changing your attitude toward that and doing what's right instead of what's wrong. Repentance really is a picture of a 180-degree turn. You might be going one way, and you turn and go the other way. That's what repentance is. You're walking according to the will of Satan, and you decide that's wrong. You want to repent and ask God to forgive you. So you turn around and go toward God, and He forgives you. That's what repentance is. But it's hard to do that. There are at least four concepts that make repentance difficult. I'm going to note three. One, repentance involves a recognition of God, as we've already discussed. In order to be motivated to repent, a person has to recognize who and what God is. That God is the one who requires us to repent. And since he does so, the command is not an option. We can't pick and choose what commands God gives us. We have to obey all of them. Repentance involves a consideration of God's goodness and long, God's long suffering, as we've already discussed. God could easily bring judgment upon us at any time, but His goodness and His long suffering, His graciousness, His love, gives us time to repent. We've got that time right now. We can never say that God never gave me a t chance to repent. He's giving you one right now. You've heard part of the gospel message, the necessity of repenting, and obeying Jesus Christ, God's giving you that opportunity right now. Are you willing to recognize God and be driven to repentance? Another thing that makes repentance hard is because it involves godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is not repentance, but 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says that godly sorrow leads us to repentance. And godly sorrow is sorrow that comes from the basis that we have sinned against Almighty God, the creator of the universe, the giver of every good and perfect gift. We have 
sinned against the very person who gave us life and who sustains our life. That's more grievous than sinning against our neighbor. Godly sorrow is a sorrow that we've sinned against God who's offered me salvation, who's long-suffering and good toward me, giving me opportunities to repent. Godly sorrow is not sorrow for what sin has done to me. Or it's not sorrow because I've been caught in sin. It's sorrow because I've sinned against God, my best friend in all the world, for now and eternity. Godly sorrow will drive a person to repentance. Being sorry that you've been caught for in a sin, or being sorry because of the bad consequences that sin has brought into your life, may not lead you to repentance. But Godly sorrow will. It will lead you to repentance because you are repenting toward God. As Paul says, he was testifying of repentance toward God. Acts 20 and verse 21. And that's what Godly sorrow will lead us to do. Thirdly, repentance involves a change of mind coupled with a change of action. We have to make sure that we are doing what's right. That's not easy. In Matthew 21. Verse 28 through 32, he's talking with two sons, both of whom are told by their father to go work in the field. One said, I will not. But then he repented and went to work in the field. The other one said, oh, I will work in the field, but he never did. So the one who was blessed, the one who was saved, the one who did what we were supposed to do was one who sinned by, by saying, I'm not going to work in the field, but then he repented. He had to change his action. He had to go out and do the hard work of whatever was waiting for him in that field. That wasn't easy, I'm sure. And obey, obedience to God today, repenting of past of our lifestyle that, that's evil or selfish in some way, turning away from that and then obeying God and putting him first, that's not an easy task either. That's hard work. That's what repentance is all about. It involves a change of mind coupled with a change of action to obey God. And then, in conclusion, repentance involves recognition of God, it involves godly sorrow, and it involves a change of mind that results in a change of life, but repentance also brings blessings. And you can be blessed by God if you're willing to repent of your sins. Anytime you choose to come to God in repentance, He'll bless you. Repentance involves God's blessings. In the parables of the sword of, uh, of Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, they all teach the same lesson. That there is rejoicing in heaven when a sinner repents and comes back to God. Sins are brought out when we repent. Refreshing comes from the Lord when one repents. Acts 3 and verse 19. Are you ready to humbly repent of your sins this morning? Are your sins standing between you and Almighty God and the blessings that can be given and will be given by God? The only thing standing in the way is your failure to repent. God's calling you to repentance this morning. Because of His long suffering, you're still alive. You deserve to be dead already. God should have put every one of us to death already because of our sins. We deserve that. But we're still here. We're living and alive. We have an opportunity to repent. And at this time, as we stand to sing a song of encouragement, if you need to repent, please do so as together we stand and as we sing.